Good morning and welcome to our Village Church service this morning. My name is Gareth. I'm a member of the, the Village Church congregation. I'm just going to be helping to lead the first part of the service. Whether you're listening for the first time or whether you're a regular worshipper with us, you are welcome and it's, it's good to have you with us wherever you're listening from this morning. God delights to meet with his people. That's the, the story of the Bible. And I love the story of God calling Moses to serve him. Moses was, was out in the wilderness. He'd messed up big time. He had killed somebody. He'd run away from his country, from his family. And there he is. He's, he's out looking after sheep, his father-in-law's sheep in the wilderness, a most unlikely place, you'd think, to encounter God. Uh, and Moses sees a burning bush, except that the bush is burning, but it's not being consumed by the fire. And, and Moses is, is curious uh, and he, he approaches this burning bush uh, and God speaks to him uh, and says, don't come any closer, God says. Take off your sandals, take off your shoes for the ground that you're standing on is holy ground. God was there speaking to Moses from this burning bush. Uh, and God goes on to tell Moses uh, that the heart he has for his people, God has heard the concerns of his people, his people in slavery. Uh, and God opens up his heart and shares with Moses his rescue plan, his amazing rescue plan for his people and how he's going to use Moses uh, as part of that plan to rescue his people. Uh, Moses met with God as he was standing on holy ground and the amazing truth is that this same God meets with us when we gather in his name. Now, our prayer is this morning as we worship him is that we know his presence with us, that as he calls us this morning that we might come away with our hearts warmed having met with him, having been challenged by his truth being comforted by, by his grace and love to serve him more. As we start our service this morning, we're going to sing two songs. The first reminding us that God does meet with us. And the second song, that what this service is about, this YouTube service, is not about some, some outward performance that we just listen into, that we tune into and then go away. But that we come away this morning having our hearts focused on Jesus and all that he has done for us. So let's worship and sing together this morning as we start our worship service.
music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart I bring you for a song in itself is not what you have required You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. King of endless world, no one could express. How much you deserve The one we can bore All I have is yours Every single breath I bring you more than a song For a song in itself is not what you Search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry to the heart of worship and it's all about you it's all about you Jesus I'm sorry Lord for the thing I've made it when it's all about you it's all about you Jesus Where do we look for for what God is like? Now, I vaguely remember listening to the uh, the late American evangelist Dr. Billy Graham, probably in the early 1970s, who said, "If I want to know what God is like, I'll take a long look at Jesus. If I want to know what God is like, I'll take a long look at Jesus. Jesus, God's Son, who set aside His Majesty." who became a man. Jesus, uh, as John describes him in his gospel account, as full of grace and truth in the opening chapter. Jesus, who was obedient to death on a cross, sacrificed in our place, that we might be restored to a relationship with God. Isn't that amazing? Where do we start our Christian walk? We start at the cross. There's a verse in psalm 16 that reads you make known to me the path of life you will fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand let's continue our worship this morning as we think about the cross that we might be overflowing with joy as we reflect on what jesus has done for us let's again sing together this morning in worship to him
what is time you can spend together today. Village church are in separate homes, but we can praise one God together but apart. We thank you for the sunshine that makes it easiest to meet outside with other family and friends that we have been missing. We thank you that through all that goes on in the world and all that happens to us, that you are a big God who can do great things and care about each each and every person and listen to us when we struggle. Lord, we pray for our nation as lockdown eases, that we don't forget to reach out to our communities and continue to build our new friendships that have blossomed with neighbours over this time. We continue to pray for the countries where COVID is still hitting hard. We pray that you will comfort families throughout this time and that Christians will rise up and talk about you when opportunities arise and that your light will shine through them. Dear Lord, please help us to trust you when things are hard and to use opportunities to share about you. We pray you will comfort comfort people around the world and in particular where it is not easy to be a Christian to stand up and be different and to know that you are with them. Lord, please be with John as he preaches the sermon today. Please help us listen to hear, hear your voice as we learn what you have to say to us today. Thank you for the book of Daniel and that we can learn by the examples of being brave and standing up for the truth by pointing to you. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Good morning, Village Church. Hi. Today's reading is going to be from Daniel chapter 3. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide, and set it up on the plain of Jura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisers, treasurers, judges, magistrates and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image that he had set up. So, the satraps, prefects, governors, advisers, treasurers, magistrates, judges and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, Nations and people of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as ev they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and people of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. Your Majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, Your Majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. 
If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, and his attitude towards them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans and other clothes were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, and these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisers, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and he shouted, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego came out of the fire. And the satraps, prefects, governors and royal advisers crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other god can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in the provinces of Babylon. Before Johnny opens up God's word for us this morning, we're going to sing an old hymn that has the theme of trusting in Jesus. Like the three young men in the account from Daniel that we've just heard read to us this morning, Louisa Stead, who wrote this song, knew what it meant to trust in Jesus even when outward circumstances seemed so bleak. Louisa penned the words to this song in 1882. It followed a, a tragic loss of a husband who had drowned trying to rescue somebody else. She had learned how precious it is to hold on to Jesus, to trust in him to know his grace in her life, no matter what was happening around her. Uh, and those, those thoughts that we, we count Jesus as precious, that we hold on to him, that we trust him, that we know his grace in our lives, that are truths that we, we echo ourselves and, and truths that we pray for each other. So as we prepare to listen to Johnny this morning, bring God's word, Let's sing this, this lovely hymn and remind ourselves of how precious Jesus is, that he is the one that we can trust in. So let's, let's sing together before Johnny comes with God's word this morning.
Welcome to Gareth's. It's really good to have you with us. Hopefully you've got a Bible. Hopefully you can see Daniel chapter 3. That's what we're looking at this morning. But before we look at that, let's ask for God's help. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the Old Testament book of Daniel. And we thank you that it was written for us. And so we pray this morning that you'd help us to concentrate despite whatever distractions there are. And Father, we pray that you'd give us humble hearts so that we'd receive what you've got to say. And we pray that by the power of the Spirit, we would respond to this chapter with faith and repentance. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Some Christians in some countries are under intense pressure. Last month in India, for example, Christians were threatened, accused, insulted, terrorised, arrested and injured. And in India that happens month after month. Some Christians in some countries are under intense pressure and for some being faithful to Christ will cost them their lives. In this country the pressure isn't intense. But the pressure is increasing. In this country, if Christians speak up, they can be shouted down. In this country, being faithful to Christ is harder today than it was 10 years ago. Sure, people don't mind if you're private about your faith, but as soon as you go public, people really do mind. If you've gone public with your faith, if you've shared something of what the Bible says about gender or marriage or sex, you may have been insulted. You may have been called a transphobic, homophobic bigot. In this country, Christians are an increasingly misunderstood, marginalised minority. Being faithful to Christ is harder today than it was ten years ago. And it will be harder in ten years than it is today. I read a newspaper article this week about assisted suicide and it said this. Denying people the option to relieve their own suffering will one day be viewed as just as barbaric and nonsensical as withholding pain relief during childbirth. Let me read that again. Denying people the option to relieve their own suffering will one day be viewed as just as barbaric and nonsensical as withholding pain relief during childbirth. Or in other words, if Christians speak up against assisted suicide, one day Christians will be viewed as barbaric and nonsensical. In this country, the pressure isn't intense, but the pressure is increasing. And if you're a Christian, if you don't already feel the heat, one day in the coming years you will. But that's why we need the Old Testament book of Daniel. This book is for Christians under pressure. This book is for us as the pressure increases to encourage us to remain faithful to Christ. In chapter 1 we were introduced to the boys in Babylon. To boys who've been exiled and enslaved. And in chapter 1, the story focused on Daniel. Daniel was under pressure not just to stay silent, but to start serving the Babylonian gods. Daniel was under pressure, but he was faithful to the Lord. This morning we're looking at chapter 3, and this story focuses on Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. And the pressure they're under is increasing. In fact, for the boys in Babylon, being faithful to the Lord means losing their lives. But Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego would rather lose their lives than be unfaithful to the Lord. You see, these boys know that the Lord reigns. They know that the Lord has the power to protect them. And so in the face of the furnace, they'll be faithful to the Lord. And for us this morning, if we can grasp something of what they grasp, as the pressure in this country increases, we too will be ready to be faithful to the Lord. In chapter 3, we're going to see the power of God's protection. But we're not going to see that until the second half of the chapter. The first half of the chapter sets the scene. And in the first half of the chapter, we see something frightening. And we see something funny. And so let's look at what's frightening here. The frightening thing here is the pressure. The pressure. We met Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, in chapter 2. And you'll remember, he was told that he was only temporary. But now in chapter 3, he wants to make himself permanent. He wants to leave a legacy. And so he makes this great image of gold. An immense intimidating image, 27 metres high, higher than five double-decker buses stood on top of each other. The image of gold is made and in verse 2 Nebuchadnezzar summons anyone who's anyone to come to the dedication of this image. Shadrach, 
Meshach and Abednego are chief ministers in Babylon. And so along with anyone who's anyone, they're summoned too. And a herald loudly proclaims, verse 4, everybody hears this, including Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Have a look at verse 4. A herald loudly proclaims, nations and peoples of every language, including you Israelites, this is what you're commanded to do. This is an order to be obeyed. As soon as you hear the sound of the big band, you must fall down and worship the image of gold. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego know that if they obey this order, they'll be disobeying the Lord. They know the commandment, you shall not make for yourself an image, and you shall not bow down to them or worship them. And that's the language being used in Daniel chapter 3. They're being commanded to bow down and worship an image, an idol, or in other words, to break this commandment. And that would mean being unfaithful to the Lord. Up until this point, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego have been under pressure. But now the pressure is increasing and they're feeling the heat. They feel the pressure of powerful people. In verses 1 to 7, every time Nebuchadnezzar is referred to, which is four times, he's referred to as King Nebuchadnezzar. You see, this command comes from the king and not just any king, but the most powerful king in the world. And when powerful people speak, we feel under pressure. We might not feel under pressure when our queen speaks, but there will be other people that make us feel under pressure. It might be a colleague, it might be a classmate, or it might be a celebrity. Celebrities are powerful people, and their power can be positive, like with Marcus Rashford and free school meals. But their power can also be negative. You see, powerful people are persuasive. When Daniel Radcliffe or Emma Watson, the leading cast members of the Harry Potter film series, when they say things like, transgender women are women, regardless of biology, that's persuasive. And people think they're speaking the truth. We feel the pressure of powerful people. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego also feel the pressure of peers. Remember, anyone who's anyone is at this dedication. And in verse 7, as soon as the people hear the sound of the big band, all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold. Everybody else bows down. Everybody else worships, apart from Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they literally stand out from the crowd. Everybody else is flat on the floor, but they're still standing. And that puts them under peer pressure. The same is true for us. Next month, when our families and friends start getting together, they'll be drinking. And there'll be lots of drinking. And if you don't get drunk with them, you'll stand out from the crowd. There will be comments, there will be criticism, criticism, and you'll feel under pressure. It would be easier just to bend down or to blend in. We too feel the pressure of peers. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego also feel the pressure of punishment here. And this is frightening. Have a look at verse 6. This is the end of the Herald's proclamation. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. This is do or die. There'll be no second chances. The boys in Babylon will be immediately punished. And it's a blazing furnace. This fire will burn their bodies to a crisp. Do you see the pressure is increasing and it's frightening. We've already said that in this country, we're not going to lose our lives for Christ. But what about the threat of losing popularity? Do you ever feel under pressure to stay silent because you don't want to lose friends? Or what about the threat of losing a promotion? Or do you ever feel under pressure to stay silent because you don't want to lose face? 
I think that's similar to Daniel chapter 3. That's the pressure of punishment. But in Daniel chapter 3, the pressure intensifies further. Some astrologers see these three standing and they go straight to Nebuchadnezzar and they denounce them or they accuse them. Have a look at what these astrologers say in verse 12. There are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. Their names are Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and they pay no attention to your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you've set up. These astrologers are envious. They don't like that Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego are chief ministers. That these Jewish exiles have got some of the top jobs in Babylon. And so they slander them. The pressure is spiteful. But the pressure here is also spiritual. In verse 8, the NIV uses the word denounced. But the ESV uses the word accused. Some astrologers came forward and accused the Jews. And in the Bible, the devil himself is the accuser. These astrologers, you see, are associated with the devil. These astrologers want Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego devoured just as the devil wants them devoured. And that was true for God's people then and that's true for God's people today. Behind the increasing pressure in this country is the devil. You see, if you're a Christian, we have an enemy who prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. That's frightening. The world is a frightening place. It was then and it is today. But do you know what a boggart is. If you've read Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban or if you've seen the film, you'll know what a boggart is. A boggart is a magical creature and when a person sees a boggart, the boggart turns into whatever they're most afraid of, like a giant spider or a giant snake. Or for Neville Longbottom, it turns into Professor Snake. And in Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, the children need to learn how to defeat a boggart. And we're going to watch how they do that now. What really finishes a boggart is laughter. You need to force it to assume a shape you find truly amusing. Let me explain. Uh, Neville, will you join me, please? Come on, don't be shy. Come on. Come on. Hello? Never. What frightens you most of all? Professor Snape. Sorry? Professor Snape. Professor Snape. <laughs> yeah. Frightens all. And I believe you live with your grandmother. Yes, but I don't want that boggart to turn into her either. <laughs> no. It won't. I want you to picture her clothes, only her clothes, very clearly in your mind. She carries a red handbag. You don't need to hear. As long as you see it, we'll see it. Now, when I open that wardrobe, here's what I want you to do. Excuse me. Imagine Professor Snape in your grandmother's clothes. Can you do that? Yes. Wand at the ready. One, two, three. If a person wants to stand up to something frightening, one way to do that is to see something funny. That's true with a boggart, and that's true with Babylon. Or for us, when things are frightening, when we're under increasing pressure, if we want to stand, if we want to be faithful, humour helps. And that's what we see in Daniel chapter 3. And so let's look at what's funny here. And the funny thing here is the pomp. The pomp. When you first read Daniel chapter 3 and you imagine the scene in your mind's eye, it looks intimidating. You imagine that 27 metre high image of gold 
and thousands and thousands of people and the big band. You imagine the herald loudly proclaiming, nations and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. And it sounds intimidating. But Daniel chapter 3 is written in a way to show us that it's all pomp. It's pantomime. It appears intimidating, but it really isn't. The 27 metre high image of gold is handmade. That's what we're told in verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold. And seven times we're told the image was set up. This image of gold was set up. It was set up, set up, set up. And don't miss this, it was set up. And the point is, this image of gold isn't worthy of worship. Even if everybody else is doing that, why would you worship a set-up image of gold? It's ridiculous. My sister and her husband live in Northern Ireland, and when we went to visit them, they took us to the north coast. And I took a photo of a place called Sheep Island, which is just off the north coast of Northern Ireland. I was pleased with the photo and so I had it printed and it now hangs on the wall in our lounge. But imagine how ridiculous it would be if I summoned you to my lounge and I loudly proclaimed, People, when you hear the sound of Spotify, you must fall down and worship the image I've set up. Imagine how ridiculous that would be. Well, that's what's going on here in Daniel chapter 3. It's pantomime. Satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates and all other provincial officials, all these powerful people, when they hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe and all kinds of music, they fall on the floor and worship this image. It's ridiculous. And for Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, Their God is the Lord, the one who reigns. He's the only one worthy of their worship. We're supposed to laugh at Daniel chapter 3. And we might laugh at Daniel chapter 3, but Britain isn't that different from Babylon, not really. The Babylonians worshipped gold. And British people worship gold too. People worship money. People want more of it so that they can have the big house and the fast car and the long holidays and the new clothes. Gold is our God too. But Daniel 3 says to us, even if everybody else is worshipping gold, look how silly that is. Why would you do that? Your God is the Lord, the one who reigns, the one who reveals and the one who rescues. Does gold have the power to protect you in life and in death? Of course not. Only the Lord has the power to protect you. And that brings us to the second half of the chapter and to the power of God's protection. The power of God's protection. In verse 13, Nebuchadnezzar is furious. He summons Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. And like a pantomime villain, he says to them, if you're ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you don't, you'll be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Nebuchadnezzar thinks he holds the power of life and death. But he really doesn't. These three know the truth. The Lord alone holds the power of life and death. And so for the first and last time in the book of Daniel, these three speak. And have a look at what they say in verses 16 to 18. King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he doesn't, we want you to know your majesty. We will not serve your gods 
or worship the image of gold you have set up. Under pressure, these three are defiant. They'll face the furnace before they forfeit their faith. And these three under pressure are dependent. They depend on the Lord. They know that his lives are in his hands and in his hands alone. And what's interesting here is what they're sure about and what they're not sure about. They're sure about God's power. The God we serve is able to deliver us. But they're not sure about God's purpose. But even if he doesn't, they know that the Lord has the power to deliver them. He can deliver them, but they don't know whether he will. And there's an important lesson for us to learn here. When things are difficult, when we're struggling, when we're sad, when we're suffering, faith says the God I serve is able to deliver me. I'm sure about his power, but I'm not so sure about his purpose. He's able to deliver me from sickness, for example, but even if he doesn't, I won't stop serving him. He's still the Lord. You see, faith isn't us telling God what to do. A defiant, dependent faith trusts what God is doing, even when we're not so sure about his purposes. Or if I was to ask you, what's the miracle in Daniel chapter 3, what would you say? You'd say the Lord delivers Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego from the fiery furnace. And if you said that, you'd be right. That's one of the miracles in this chapter. But I think there's another miracle here. Under intense pressure, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego are faithful to the Lord and that's a miracle. And every time a Christian is under pressure at home or at school or at work, and every time they're faithful to the Lord, that's a miracle. That's the power of God's spirit in you right there, right then. Nebuchadnezzar is furious and things start to move fast. The furnace is heated seven times hotter than usual. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego are tied up and they're thrown into the flames. And this isn't a fairy tale, remember. This is real. Nebuchadnezzar watches as the three men fall into the fire. One, two, three, four. There's a fourth man. Who's that? Look. Nebuchadnezzar shouts in verse 25, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound, unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, come out, come here. Some commentators suggest that the fourth man is the son of God. This is the son of God before he became flesh. This is the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. And that might be right. But it might not be. This could be an angel, which is what Nebuchadnezzar says in verse 28. We're not really told either way. But what we are told is that in one way or another, the Lord was with them in the fire. It's the power of God that protects them. And again, there's an important lesson for us here. As Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego fell into the fire, the Lord doesn't put the fire out. The fire isn't extinguished. They fall into the flames, but the Lord is with them. And the New Testament tells us that Christians will suffer grief, will suffer all kinds of trials and that it will feel like fire. But the New Testament tells us that we're shielded by God's power. We're not shielded from sickness or sadness, but we are shielded for salvation. If you're a Christian, if you depend on Jesus Christ for forgiveness, the Holy Spirit has been given to you. He's in your heart and he's a promise of future and final salvation, an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. 
When Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego come out of the fire, they're unharmed. The fire hasn't harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their heads singed, verse 37. Their robes weren't scorched and there was no smell of fire on them. The Lord was with them and he brought them through the fire and his protection was perfect. The Lord is the one who rescues. He rescued Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and he rescued them from death. He took them through death to life again. And if you're a Christian, Daniel 3 isn't a promise that God will protect us from difficulty. Daniel 3 is a promise that God will protect us from death. He'll take us through death to life again. And even if the fourth man here isn't the Son of God, the New Testament is clear. God the Son did become a man. Jesus Christ is God the Son and he's the proof that he can take us through death and into life. The proof is that he died and rose again. He went through death to life again and he promises anyone who transfers their trust to him, anyone who is faithful to him, anyone who serves and worships him, he promises us that he'll take us through death to life again. If you're a Christian, you can be sure of two things. You can be sure about the pressure. There will be pressure, pressure to stop trusting Christ, Christ, increasing intense pressure. But you can also be sure about the promise. God promises to protect you today and tomorrow and the day you die. God promises to protect us, to protect us through death and into life again. Daniel chapter 3 started with a decree and this chapter finishes with a decree. Have a look at verse 29. Nebuchadnezzar says, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses turned into piles of rubble. Nebuchadnezzar is clearly a few sandwiches short of a picnic. But have a look at what he says next. For no other God can save in this way. The God of the Bible, Father, Son and Spirit, is the only God with the power to protect us from death. And whoever you are, and wherever you're watching this morning, he is the only one worthy of our worship. He is the God who saves. Let's take a moment of quiet and then we'll sing our final song. We're going to sing our final song, a song called The Lord is My Salvation. So let's sing together.
That's the end of our formal service this morning and again our prayers that each one of us might have met with the living Lord Jesus that we might have known his presence with us as we've worshipped together this morning that we might have been challenged by God's word as as God's word has been read as as Johnny has opened up this this Old Testament Bible story that we might have been challenged by those three young men Shadrach Meshach and Abednego of their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ that he was the one who would rescue them and again that each one of us in turn might know what it means to, to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for our salvation. For those of us who are regulars again we look forward to seeing you shortly as we meet after the service on Zoom if you need those uh, details again please either send your home group leader or perhaps Johnny a, a message and uh, once you've had time to, to boil the kettle, we look forward to, to meeting up with you again, just to have some further fellowship with each other, uh, to be an encouragement with each other. Uh, but I'll just finish now with a, with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for that privilege we've had this morning to meet with you. We thank you that indeed you are the one who is alive. Uh, and Father God, we pray that we might be challenged by what your word has said to us this morning but also encouraged that you are a God who can be trusted, that you are a God who has rescued us through your work on the cross, through Jesus' sacrifice in our place. For we pray this in your name. Amen.